right, so we already talked about um, brainstorming in our previous discussion. And for you right now, we will be talking about graphic organizers. And then later on, you will move with outlining. Okay. So graphic organizers, what are graphic organizers? Graphic organizers are simply visual representations of different concepts that enables us to structure information into different organizational patterns, okay? So what makes them graphic, okay? They, it's called graphic because whenever you see a graphic organizer, you already know what type of information is there and how is the information organized. So one look at it, you already have an idea, okay, of what that particular um, type of graphic organizer is all about or even what type of information is it going to be giving you as a reader, okay? Um, all right, so why is that the case? Now, graphic organizers are very important because um, these are types or a technique, this is a technique of organizing information that presents essential information. And these essential, these pieces of information are connected in such a way that it presents a coherent framework, okay? Like what I have mentioned earlier, just one look at it, you would already know what information is there, okay? Now, they are very important because they help others focus on the relationships of the different ideas, the different um, ideas about that particular topic that you are going to discuss and the connections among them, okay? And similarly, other details may be presented as well. Now, there are many different kinds of graphic organizers, but for this lesson, we would only be focusing on the, um, the graphic organizers that you are most familiar with, or maybe these are the graphic organizers that you are using more often. Okay, so we have the Venn diagram, network tree, the spider map, the problem solution map, the timeline, plot diagram, chain diagram, fishbone map, cycle, and the persuasion map. Okay, we'll go to the first one, which is what we refer to as the Venn diagram. Perhaps this is the most common or commonly used, most commonly used um, type of graphic organizer, okay? And the Venn diagram is very easy to make. It's, um, we use it to compare ideas and events. And when we say compare, again, we identify the similarities and the differences between two different ideas or two different topics, okay? Now, how do we create a Venn diagram? You use two or more overlapping circles, just like this one, okay? So this is a funny picture that I just found on the internet. Um, it's just a Venn diagram. If you're familiar with Ben and Ben, then you already know why this makes a lot of sense or why this makes some, why this makes, or why this is a very funny meme or um, posting on the internet. All right, so on a, on a more serious note, we have this example for the Venn diagram, okay? So this particular Venn diagram is comparing um, the Great Dane and the Poodle, both of which are, breeds of dogs, okay? Now, for the Venn, di the Venn diagram, it's very easy to identify where are the similar attributes and where are the um, differences. So where are the similarities and where are the differences between these two ideas, okay? All right, so as you can see, it's overlapping. The overlapping part or the green area on this one is where you can write down the similarities between these two topics. So whereas those two um, separate parts, the blue side and the yellow side is where you can write down their differences. So take for example, Great Dane and the Poodle, they are both happy puppies and they don't, both of these puppies don't bark a lot, okay? Whereas in terms of eating, Great Danes usually eat a lot and Poodles don't eat that much. Great Danes also grows large, or Great Danes grow large, and Poodles often stay small. And in terms of their um, disposition, the Great Danes 
more often than not calm and relax whereas the poodle would like to play around and they are very energetic and excited okay now um the thing that i would like to point out when using venn diagram is when you are writing down the similarities and the differences make sure that you are using one specific criteria so take for example in here it talked about the eating the eating criteria um the size okay the uh the size their disposition and even the amount of shedding that they do so you can compare them using the same criteria it's organized in such a way that you compare them in the same criteria okay all right let's move on to the next one which is network three when we say network three it is a type of graphic organizer that we use to represent hierarchy classification branching or even showing off relationships more often than not network trees are used to identify scientific categories and family trees and even lineages okay so it just shows relationships this is an example of a network tree. So you have one main idea, and then it could branch out into little ideas. Or this main idea is related to two different ideas that could branch out to or related to could be related to different other ideas. Okay, so take for example this one. There are on the on the left side, you can see that it talks about the US currency. So US currency. Sorry, excuse me. It's a one big, one, one big umbrella of um, idea. U.S. currency is composed of coins and paper. So as for the coins, there are colored coins, and which are copper and silver. And for copper, there are pennies. For silver, there are dimes and quarters. As for the paper, paper currency, you have the one dollar bill and the five dollar bit. Okay. So you can do the same for the Philippine currency. For example, we also have coins and paper. So what type of coins do we have? What type of paper currency do we have? You can write that down as well. Okay. Other than that, um, network trees are also used to show um, organizational mapping. So take, for example, the different, um, how do I say this? The different people in an organization how are they interconnected or connected to one another so who is on top who is at the bottom who works for whom okay those type of things you can represent them using a network tree we also have what we refer to as a spider map it is also known as the semantic map or more commonly known as the semantic map. And the semantic map or the spider map is what we use to investigate and enumerate various aspects of one central idea. So there's one big idea that you are trying to examine. It could be a concept, a topic, or a specific theme. Okay, so take for example this one. It looks, it's called a spider map because if you are trying to um, map it out, using shapes using sizes using or sorry using shapes using lines okay it looks like a spider so we have here in the middle using a circle or a round shape you can write down the topic or the central theme okay and then you can branch out you can use lines to show that there are main ideas that may support this particular topic okay and then you can use smaller lines to create or to include details about this particular main idea. Okay, next, problem solution map. Problem solution maps display the nature of a particular problem and how it could be solved. So more often than not, there is a problem that is identified. And as a writer, as a source of information, we're trying to figure out how we can provide a solution for this particular problem, okay? And how can we do that? So for you to be able to do that, you need to identify the problem first. You try to name it and then define it. 
Next, you can identify the causes. What is causing this particular issue? What is causing this particular problem? Okay. Similarly, you also try to identify the different effects that it could have. Okay. So who is affected by this particular issue? And how does it affect them? Okay. And then after identifying these three, you can identify or present your solution how can we solve these problems now that we know what's causing it how it's affecting other people what basically is this problem then you can identify present your solutions all right the next one is a timeline timelines are also very common and more often than not we can find it in history books okay and timelines are basically used to show how certain events occurred chronologically okay and when we say chronologically we are basically basing it on the time that it happened okay and it's represented using a long bar or a long line labeled with dates and specific events so you try to identify these the dates when it happened okay and what particular event happened during that particular Okay, so there are two different types of timeline. The first one is what we call as a linear timeline. The second one is what we can refer to as a comparative timeline. So both of these timelines use a line, all right? In a linear timeline, it basically just shows how events or how certain events happen within one particular period, okay? So you try to identify one particular period of time. Whereas, in a comparative timeline, you still have the same period. However, there are two different sets of events. So for linear timeline, there's one set of events, one period. But in comparative timeline, there are two sets of events in two, or sorry, there are two sets of events in one period, okay? So let's look at this for example. This is an example of a simple linear timeline. So it's just the period that we are referring to here is from 1960 to 2020, okay? Since this is just an example, you can see that it might be about a development of something, okay? But let's try to look at this next figure or next picture, okay? The period that we are looking at is from 1980, from the year 1980, to 1995 okay and the two events that are being compared here are the developments in the music industry and in the field of science so there the time the time the time period is the same but the events for music and for for music industry and the field of science are very different so you try to look at in 1980, like what happened in music, what happened in science. In 1990, what happened in music, what happened in science. Okay, so you try to compare it. That's why it's called comparative timeline. Okay, the next one is plot diagram. Plot diagrams are simple to make, but because um, you already have a basis, a source of information. Okay, it's basically used to map events, certain events in the story or analyze major parts of a plot. More often than not, we use a plot diagram after reading a particular text or a particular story. Okay, so we can, we can say that a plot diagram has this parts, okay? So the first one is the exposition, the conflict, the rising action, the climax, the falling action, and the resolution. The exposition is simply the beginning of your story. So what happened at the beginning of the story? And then as the story progresses, as it goes up, okay, there are conflicts that are happening. There are certain events that lead to a problem, okay, or an, an issue in the story. And then it goes up, the, the topmost part of your uh plot diagram is what we can refer to as the climax it's the most exciting part of the story what is the most exciting part of the story 
And then after after the most exciting part of the story, just like a roller coaster, a ride in a roller coaster, it goes downhill. And those um, events that lead up to the end, the very end of the story, are what we call falling or what we call falling actions. So these are certain events that would lead to the end or the conclusion of your story. As for the end, the last part of the story, we can call it as the resolution. Okay, so this is a specific example of a plot diagram about the three little pigs. So we can say that at first, for the exposition, the three little pigs leave their home for the first time. Okay, and then the events leading up to the to the climax is when the wolf tried to or is or it's when the wolf tried to blow the houses of the pigs down okay but then of course the pigs are the one pig is very smart so the wolf wasn't able to blow the house down but he he still thought of an idea on how to get to the wolf to the pigs okay so that's the climax of the story and then obviously at the end okay the pigs won against the big bad wolf all right the next one is the chain diagram and when we say chain diagram we use it to show logical sequence of events it's similar in a way to plot diagram because it's used to plot the events of the story okay however in this one it doesn't matter in the chain diagram, it doesn't matter if it's the climax or you don't have to identify if it's the climax, if it's the exposition, if it's the falling action, etc., etc. Okay, in the chain diagram, you just simply show what happened to the to the story, what happened in the story. Okay, but you do it in a way that it's still chronologically arranged. Okay, so take for example this one. A chain diagram is very really simple. You can use boxes and arrows to do it. So for the first box on top, you can use an initiate you can write down an initiating event. And then what leads up to that particular event, and then the next and the next and the next until you reach the very end of the, the story or the conclusion of the story. Okay, next one you also have the fishbone map. Fishbone maps are used to better understand causal relationship of a certain or a complex phenomenon. Um, and you do this by showing different factors that may cause that specific event or problem. And what are the details of the causes? Okay, so in here, you already identify, there is already an identified effect okay but what was the cause of that particular thing what caused that particular topic or what caused that particular idea okay that's what we mean by causal relationship okay so take for example this one you already identified the result okay or the effect of that this one and that's your main central topic okay and then you can see that using lines you can create um different or you can identify causes by using different lines and if you're gonna look at it it actually really looks like a fish bone okay so here is a more detailed example of that one so the effect that is already identified here is a miss deadline okay that's already the effect of whatever that's causing it okay so what what causes you can identify what causes miss deadline why is it difficult for uh, for teachers or sorry for students to submit um, requirements on time what's causing it so you try to identify those issues okay it could be people it could be the method it could be the measurement it could be environment it could be the materials or it, even it could be the machine so like for example right now um, limited connection could be a cause of missing a deadline okay the next one is a cycle. A cycle basically describes how a series of events interact to produce a set of results repeatedly. So that's why it's called a cycle. According to Sarah G, ikot ikot lang, ikot ikot lang. Okay, so a cycle basically looks like a circle. Okay, and there are a series of events that are interconnected or rather connected to one another. So one event leads to 
another event and then that event leads to another and so on and so forth until you go back at the very start okay that's what makes it a circle so you always go back to where you started okay take for example this one if you're going to visualize it or if you're going to draw a graphic organizer for a cycle you can use arrows okay you can use pictures and arrows to identify the relationship among these events okay so take for example the butterfly life cycle which we can often see in science textbooks it starts from the eggs turning into larvae and then grows a chrysalis around themselves and then becomes an adult and that adult eventually lays eggs repeating the life cycle of the butterfly okay the last one is the persuasion map and when we see persuasion map we use it to map out certain arguments and list down evidence to support these arguments okay it's very necessary because you are trying in using a persuasion map you are trying to prove a certain point okay you are trying to prove a certain viewpoint and it's especially useful when we are processing persuasive or argumentative texts. Okay, so take for example, you're going into a debate, okay, and you or you were asked to write an argumentative essay or a persuasive essay. A persuasion map is a very good tool in organizing the information that you need to present all of your arguments and present similarly present your evidence as well. Okay, so this is an example of a persuasion map. We will not go into details about it because it could be a bit technical, but know that this is an example. It's, this is an, also a good example of, or a good tool in organizing information, okay? So if you are going to write essays, you are going to um, join or engage in debates, okay? You can use a persuasion map to do that. Okay, benefits of graphic organizer. Why is it beneficial for us to use? Okay, the first one is it helps us to visualize or present information in a way that is easier to comprehend. Since it's graphic in nature, meaning it uses lines, it uses colors, it uses shapes, okay? Sometimes it could even use illustrations. It's very easy for us to one just one look at it it's very easy for us to identify what type of information is already presented and if you're going to write one or make a graphic organizer it's also very easy for you okay in a way it's also it could also be um, a creative way to express the information that you want to relate okay it also provides opportunity for everyone to actively contribute and participate in the learning process so similarly to just like in brainstorming we can also give opportunities for other students or for other members of the group to contribute to the information gathering okay or the collection of the data next it also develops or graphic organizers develop cognitive skills such as brainstorming critical and creative thinking categorizing and prioritizing content reflection etc so it tries to establish higher order thinking skills by making you think despite the irony in this statement by making you think outside the box because you try to fill in certain parts of the graphic organizers by um, providing the information that it needs or that it requires okay Similarly, graphic organizers also help you recall prior knowledge about a particular subject and quickly connect it to new information. Like what I have mentioned earlier, graphic organizers' main goal is to establish connections, to establish relationships. So by using graphic organizers, you are also trying to show the relationship among the ideas that you have presented okay it also promotes self-learning and students can actually familiarize themselves with the lesson far more easily 
So instead of writing down words, writing down letters, writing all of the things that you can see, you can actually utilize graphic organizers, especially when you are taking down notes. All right, here are my sources and references. That's all.